<clears throat> Welcome into our midweek Bible study. Glad to uh, see you here and, and be a part of this. Hope you're well and um, enjoying the, the change in weather. It's been, been beautiful, hasn't it? Now before we begin, let's, let's ask God's blessings on our time. Our holy God, we bow in your presence. We're thankful for the day you've given us. Uh, we don't want to take for granted the fact that you give us life and you care for us and provide for us. Thank you for being our God and for calling us into a relationship with you where we can thrive spiritually and be prepared for eternity. Thank you for Jesus, our Savior. Help us to be faithful to him, to, to learn of him, and to walk like him. Thank you for the ministry of your spirit and help us to be faithful followers of yours. Uh, pray special blessing on all those who are part of our study tonight. Um, may they be strengthened by this time in your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we uh, are developing this, this study entitled uh, Testing the Spirits. It's based out of 1 John chapter 4. And of course, this is not the only place where we could study this idea in the New Testament, but it's one of the really good places. Um, you know, as, as 1 John chapter 4 begins, um, we have this strange command, do not believe. Uh, John says, beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. And so then he goes on. He doesn't just leave that <clears throat> as a flat statement. He goes on and talks about specific tests we can apply to various spirits that claim to be promoting uh, spiritual truth. Those spirits may be a person or a church or whatever it might be, a religious system. Um, a lot of people claim to be proclaiming truth, but we are to test the spirits to see if they're really from God. And there are five tests given here in these eight verses uh, at the beginning of 1 John 4. And uh, last week we looked at number one, and that was, does the system or the teacher or the church or whatever it might be, does it teach the true Jesus? And that comes out of Verses two and three. Uh, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and is now in the world already. So uh, the test is, does it tell us the truth about Jesus? And uh, we, we developed that a little bit and talked about it last week. We're gonna move on to test number two uh, that comes to us in the next couple of verses uh, this evening. Now, one of the questions I hear people ask a lot is why are there so many different churches? Uh, that's probably a question we all have. Uh, how did there come to be so many different churches? Uh, where did they come from? That kind of thing. and. It's an interesting question. It's a, it's a historical question, you know, um, and it's an important question, but maybe even more important is this question. How can I decide if a given teacher or a, a given religious movement is one I should uh, receive teaching from? In other words, is it right what they're saying? And uh, that is really the, the all-important task of spiritual discernment. And that's what we're talking about in this study. How do we, how do we become spiritually discerning? Um, 
It's interesting, in the early church, there was a specific spiritual gift called discernment, which they needed uh, in a time before um, the full scripture was available to him, like, like to them like we have today. I think there was a miraculous gift of spiritual discernment in the first century. We still need to practice discernment, but we do it based on the word of God, which the Holy Spirit has inspired. So again, John says, don't believe every spirit, but test them. And, and why is that? Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And then he goes and, and he tells us how to do this. And um, there are at least five tests that he gives uh, here in 1 John 4. Again, number one, just sort of um, repeating. Uh, number one was, does it teach the true Jesus? That's what we talked about last week. Number two, let's, let's uh, read again verses four and five of this passage. It says there, little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world and the world listens to them. Test number two in testing the spirits that John gives us is, is this question. Is the spirit or the teacher or the church or whatever it is, is the spirit against worldliness? Is it against worldliness? Now, it's interesting that uh, although so much time has passed since these words were written, you know, about 2,000 years, not much has really changed. Um, it is still an issue of godliness versus worldliness. And so John writes here, they, that is the false prophets that he's talking about, they speak from the world and the world listens to them. Uh, we know that, that Jesus warned his, his disciples that the world wasn't going to like what they had to say and they were going to persecute them. And so we might be a bit suspicious if the world is okay with everything a, a given spirit or teacher says. John says they, the false prophets, speak from the world and the world listens to them. So again, the test is, is the spirit against worldliness? Does it stand opposed to worldliness? Let's look at a couple of other texts that uh, will, will fill this out for us. Let's start in the book of Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and we're going to read beginning in verse 5. And I think you'll see right away why, why we turn to this text. Romans 8, 5, Paul wrote, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Uh, but there's a lot in that, but you know that phrase in there that says these people who are devoted to the flesh, uh, to the world, cannot submit to God's law. That's a problem, you see. And that's a problem a lot of times with false prophets, false spirits. Um, they, have, they have a problem with the concept of law to begin with and submitting to God's law, that is obeying what God says, is an issue. And uh, Paul sets it pretty straight here. You know, there's some that live according to the flesh and some uh, according to the spirit. And so we need to keep that in mind. And then if we go to another one of Paul's letters, Galatians, 
Galatians chapter 5, I believe. Yeah, chapter 5. We're going to see something similar here, and he adds some to it. In fact, he gets more specific about what he's talking about. Uh, Galatians 5, 16. It says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. This sounds just like Romans 8, doesn't it? The desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For though these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. Now, here's where he gets more specific about what he's talking about. In verse 19, now the works of the flesh are evident. He makes a list. What are the works of the flesh? Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So, um, he, like I said, he goes into more detail there about exactly what he's talking about when he talks about uh, works of the flesh or the desire of the flesh. He gives a list. This isn't every possible work of the flesh, but it's a, a good sample of the kinds of things that those that are devoted to the world do. And, um, and it shows, again, the idea that you just, if you're indulging in these things, you, you cannot be in the kingdom of God. And then you compare that to what he goes on and says in verse 22, same chapter of Galatians 5. But the fruit of the Spirit. Okay, so he's talked about the works of the flesh. Now the fruit of the Spirit in verse 22 is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. All right, so we, in those three passages, we sort of get uh, the lay of the land here, what we're talking about versus you know, worldliness versus life in the spirit. And false prophets, according to John, False teachers, false teachings are closely tied to the world. Again, if we go back to 1 John chapter um, 4 and verse 5, he says, they are from the world. All right. So, again, it's this issue of worldliness versus godliness. And uh, just another couple of verses from from 1 John, back in chapter 2 this time. Notice what he says, you know, previous to the text we're really focusing on in chapter 4. 1 John 2, 16. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. So you've got, again, this idea of um, some in love with the world, and that sort of makes them in opposition to God. All that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, not from God, but from the world. So we have this uh, common pattern, we might say, of false spirits, false teachers, and it is this, that they promise, they promise people who are lost the very things that their sinful, worldly hearts already desire, if you can follow what I'm saying. They promise lost people uh, the very uh, things that they already want. 
you see, in order to draw them in. And then they pretend that they've become spiritual uh, by using all this religious language. Uh, it sort of baptize the works of the flesh, in a sense, is what happens. And that's a pattern of, of false spirits, false teachers. If we look back just for a second at the Galatians passage that we read, uh, Galatians 5, the, the list of the works of the flesh. Okay, go back there. Galatians 5, it, the works of the flesh begin in verse 19. If you just sort of peruse down through the list of works of the flesh, um, there are several that stand out to me that false spirits or false teachers attempt to baptize, speaking figuratively, uh, in order to appeal to people in the world, okay? For instance, the very first one on the list, sexual immorality. There's a strong tendency among false prophets to water down uh, the Bible's teaching on sexual immorality and sexual purity, okay? And to su suggest that uh, some of the things that the Bible says about certain sexual sins it doesn't really say, or we shouldn't take it seriously. Times have changed, and so, um, you know, we're not going to enforce such things. Um, that is, you know, it, that's a sign that the spirit or the teacher is not against worldliness. I mean, if they're promoting worldliness and works of the flesh, then they ought to be suspect in everything they're saying. Uh, sexual immorality leads this list for a reason. And the things God says about uh, where sexual activity is blessed and, and where it's designed to take place within a marriage between a man and a woman, uh, and them being faithful to one another, you know, a deviation from that is sin according to scripture, but there's there's so many people today trying to appeal to others because we have all these works of the flesh in the world. They're trying to appeal to others by saying, oh, we're not going to, to talk about that much, or the Bible really doesn't say that, or it's outmoded and, and we're gonna update it. You see, they're, um, they're speaking from the world and the world will listen to that. You know, they will indeed have su some success in drawing people who are interested in spiritual things, but are struggling with these sins. So again, the pattern is they promise lost people um, the very things that, that they already desire and, and, um, and then they pretend it's okay. All right. Also in that list, I, I see uh, idolatry, for instance, in, in verse 20, just picking out one or two others. Idolatry. Okay. We often think idolatry is a first century thing. We don't struggle with idolatry, but I don't know. I, I see the way um, some groups worship uh, preachers, pastors. Uh, the celebrity cult that, that is around some um, well-known uh, teachers um, is much like idolatry. You know, putting somebody on a pedestal that only belongs to Jesus is, is idolatry. And so uh, that the whole issue of celebrity and um, just taking whatever people say because we like them, or we think they're great, uh, is, is worldly. And then another one uh, in the list, if you go just a little bit further into verse 21, drunkenness as an example. Uh, the Bible's pretty clear about warning against drinking, warning against especially strong drink, and indulging in it unto drunkenness. Um, there's a lot in scripture about that. And it is sort of a popular thing among some false spirits, some false teachers, 
to suggest that, uh, you know, we've been wrong about that and too strict about that. And really, we can indulge in such things and, and be perfectly fine. And they'll quote certain favorite passages, you know, Paul, for instance, recommending some medicine to Timothy for his stomach's sake to take a little wine. I'm not going to go into that. It's sort of a ridiculous text to use to say drunkenness is okay. And, uh, you know, other passages um, of a similar vein. Okay, but the idea is you, uh, no doubt people like to indulge in strong drink and like to get drunk. And, um, and, and there are people in the spiritual realm and churches and so forth that are promoting the idea that uh, we ought to just get over our hangups about that and be cool in order to attract others. Uh, we ought to flirt with worldliness, in other words, in order to convert the world. And we just don't find that from the apostles and their writings. And instead, John says, they speak from the world and the world listens to them. You know, in, in 1 John 4. And then he compares that to what he was doing. We are not from the world. Uh, we are from God. You see, it's, it's one or the other. You can't have your foot in both. Verse 6 of our text, we are from God. Uh, they are from the world. Therefore, they speak from, from the world, and the world listens to them. Uh, and then, you know, his encouragement, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. All right. So that's just... Again, the test is, is the spirit or the teacher, the teaching, is it against worldliness? Does it speak out against worldliness? Um, the true spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, strives to make people holy, more holy, strives to sanctify people, which automatically means makes them less worldly, okay? That's what we're looking for. It's, it's one of the signs of truth. Um, the first one is, is it teaching the true Jesus, that Jesus was real, that he, he was a man come in the flesh? Um, is it teaching and promoting the true Jesus, number one? Number two, is it against worldliness? Um, and both those tests have to be passed. For, for something to be truly of God. Uh, don't believe every spirit, but test them to see whether they're from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Uh, the next test that we'll look at, uh, number three, is does it uphold God's word? Does the, the spirit, the teacher, the church, whatever it is, does it uphold God's word? Is God's word respected and, and believed uh, and held at the center of things? Uh, and, and we will next time look at a little bit more detail on that. That starts really in, in verse 6. Um, but that's an important one as well. And you sort of see how these all work together. Okay, so we're, we've done two of the five tests, and I hope you'll think about these and, um, and maybe jot them down so you can, when you're evaluating something you hear, you can apply these. I mean, it doesn't take a degree uh, to apply these tests. These tests come from, from John the Apostle, inspired of God, uh, and um, he meant us meant them to be very practical in evaluating things that we hear. Does it teach the true Jesus? Is it against worldliness? And next time, does it uphold God's word? Uh, there are five tests in total, and we will gradually work through each one. Again, hope you're doing very well and you're having a great week. Uh, looking forward to this Sunday at, at Lancaster. Uh, not only our time of worship, but uh, we're going to welcome some new deacons into our work. And uh, that's going to be exciting and a 
forward-looking time. And hope you'll be there for that. So take care, um, stay well, and and uh, stay on the path. We will see you soon.